Yine e, uzaklardan bağlandığımız bir konumuz olacak. Bizimle birlikte değil yüz yüze ama online şekilde biz onun yanına uzaklara gidiyor olacağız efendim. Yine çok önemli bir konu konuşacağız. Web 3'e dönüyoruz aslında. Web 3'te finansal teknoloji ve sertifikasyon sistemi konuşmasıyla Profesör Doktor Yönetim Kurulu Başkanı GFF IN SAS Üniversitesi'nden David Lee bizimle birlikte. Yes, sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David Lee, and first of all, I'd like to thank Euro Eurasia Blockchain Summit and the organizer for inviting me here today. Uh, my topic today will be on Web3 opportunities and challenges. And I'm sure you have listened to Professor Duffy, and that was a very interesting talk on quantum and quantum resistance uh, for blockchain. But uh, over here, I'm going to talk about Web3 and what is Web3. And there are many definitions, but today I'm going to give you a diagrammatic approach to this. If you look at the left side of your um, screen, you can see the Web2, and it's also known as the surface webs. Uh, it is usually dominated by shifting, censorship, and data indexing. And you're looking at the bottom, uh, you can assess the web to through the browse, browser and from there through the internet you go on to the front end whenever you go on to your um, internet uh, you can download a lot of information you can read them and you can even contribute your data and at the back end you can see in the box there there will be other programming language in there and and, and there will be a web server at the back with the database now, if you look at the web tree on the right hand side, you will see a different uh, diagram altogether. You can see the front end there. You can see the virtual machine there with lots of smart contracts at the bottom. And then through the consensus, whether it's proof of work or proof of stake, blocks will be formed. Or it could be not blockchain, but any other distributed technology. But more specifically, I think a lot of people uh, have ignored the importance of Web3. Web3 is more than just owning one's data, and therefore you are able to transfer your digital assets in the data form peer to peer without an intermediary. If you look at the diagram on the left, uh, right side, um, we can look at um, the decentralized Oracle, which is used by smart contracts uh, to basically just an external data provider um, for the smart contracts. The, the danger there is that uh, it can be centralized too. The whole idea about Web 3.0 is to be decentralized. So the Oracle, which is the external data source that the smart contract pull into the contract, should really be decentralized in the Web 3. And you look further down, even for the internet, it should be decentralized, uh, especially for any communication that we do. If in the first layer, um, it is not decentralized, then the whole idea of Web3 being de decentralized uh, will be difficult to achieve. And of course, the browser itself should also be decentralized. So in effect, a true Web3 should Therefore, not only allow you to read, write, and own your data, but really you should have a decentralized internet browser communication, which is a transport layer, and Oracle. So the key question we got to ask ourselves is what are the advantages of Web3? Well, everybody knows that it's going to be censorship resistance, uh, no single point of failure, faster browsing speeds, lower costs of usage and storage, and of course, disaster resilience when there's anything that's happened to uh, the centralized communication internet, you can actually have your distributed communication. So the examples of decentralized oracles will be company like Chainlink, Bnet, uh, Oracleize, Town Crier, and examples of decentralized communication or the transport layer is like Smart Mesh, Meshbox, Helium, PKT. And for 
decentralized browser, people who are familiar with uh, IPFS, will be brave, unstoppable browsers, uh, O-series browser as well. Now, the risk of this is, of course, uh, a lot of criminal activities can take place in some of this decentralized browser communication and so on. But in reality, um, besides those links to finance, the rest of the decentralized communication and browser are not looked upon favorably by the Web2 community. The liquidity and the interest are simply not there, but mainly on looking into the smart contracts and the DeFi, GameFi, and all the FI that we are talking about. So there are signs of over-financialization in the Web3 community because the decentralized communication and browser and other areas are really beyond finance and have a lot of real-world application that can contribute, contribute to the society, the country, and the mankind and can create a lot more jobs. And meantime, from the Web2 community, um, the Web2 companies have shown uh, great and show, have shown an in, increased interest in Web3 for two reasons. One, there's, they they wanted to or they want to increase the network effect, uh, growing by rent seeking as they've done to 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 use your data to generate more income without your permission. In many cases, will become more challenging with a lot of data privacy protection uh, regulation and rules. So by looking into Web3, it can slow down the erosion of profits using uh, Web3 and also buy the Web3 projects. It will buy them some time uh, in the transition as well. Secondly, uh, not only the data privacy uh, protection regulation will impose a lot of constraint on Web2 con companies, there is also the problem of privacy protection and security as well. So in order to increase security, Web2 uh, will start looking a lot in Web3 and they have already started investing in a lot of Web3 companies. And this is to so make sure that there will be lower fines for data and privacy security breaches as there's always a single point of attack and also increase security to a world of the hacking. So if you look at this, the Web2 network effect is slowly waning uh, it is not a very rosy picture. On the right-hand side, you can see many of the um, startups linked to Web2. The cumulative losses uh, are beginning to exceed the funds that they raised. So this is not a very good sign. It is unclear how long more they can uh, get the investor interested and continue to have to burn uh, and have a very high burn rate. So it's the same in Euro Europe as well. It's the same in China, and the same in India, as well as Singapore that we have here. We have Grab and C. Uh, they all have multi-billion dollar cumulative losses, and in a lot of cases, more than the fund raise uh, that they, they have. So secondly, for the network effect for Web2, from the developer's perspective, there is a lack of interoperability uh, because the software must be written specifically for the platform. Uh, there is a lack of uh, composability. Most programs are not able to plug into each other. And also, there is a lock-in perpetual revenue share with the Web2 companies. So the developers are looking into alternatives. And from the user perspective, there's a lack of asset portability. Whatever you own in your games is not portable. Uh, it is still on the platform. You can't take it to trade somewhere else. There's lack of monetization opportunities. They are unable to monetize uh, their creation. Uh, and also, there's no character creation capability, uh, including the breeding of some of the gaming animals that one has and also of course it is permission access user cannot participate without being approved by the central party or authorized by an intermediaries so you can see that uh, the web tree 
network effect is different because you can create, you can contribute, and you can pay to earn via the uh, creation and the minting of crypto coins, uh, the ERC20 in the Ethereum network of fungible token. Uh, of course, you can have fungible tokens onto any uh, open blockchain. And then there's ERC721 for the non-fungible token, the ERC1155 for the multiple fungible tokens and NFTs. And also the very interesting ERC3525 that the NFT or the character they have, they, you, or the avatar that you have created can own value, which is the fungible tokens. Now this will allow uh, value creation. You can build, you can mint, uh, as a game developers, you can build games, you can main, get, main the, the assets, uh, anything that you want to use, the guns, uh, the equipment, and you the, for the independent artists, they can mint their, their art, their music, uh, the videos, and for the virtual land owners, they can build the virtual space and they can invest in themselves. And for the players, they can participate, they can breed, they can purchase, they can... Uh, have equipment and they can have land. So once they have done that, then they can start having sales and royalty uh, that they can start earning and so that they can monetize the games for the gamers, they can monetize the digital art for the, the independent artists, they can start sticking to get income for the virtual lands and they can start to play to earn and breed to earn and they can monetize the digital assets and streaming. Okay. Now, I would I mentioned about the first thing, which is the network effect that the Web2 is trying to increase. There's a second issue that the Web2 they're concerned about is security. Uh, as, as you know, Nick Sabo in many years ago has written about Web2 is a security hole because uh, we have to understand what is commercial security, then immediate uh, that we can realize what is a security hole. Now, what we are trying to do in commercial security is to have privacy, is to, in, to have integrity of the data, is to protect the, the property rights, the digital assets that's owned by any of us who is on Web3 and, and on Web2, and then also the contract enforcement. And some of this, we already have a solution in Web3, but it is a tawny pain points for Web2. So a security host is any weakness that increases the risk of violating these goals that we see, which is privacy, integrity of data, uh, digital assets, rights, uh, and also the contract enforcement. Now, what uh, we need to, to talk about is what constitutes a security host. And Web2 is about a trusted third party. And in the invocation assumption in the security protocol is that there must always be a trusted third party, whether it's a bank, an insurance company, a custody, or a certificate authority. There must be a trusted computing base uh, like cloud. There must be a, it must be controlled by a third party or is a regulator or licensed entity. All these constitute the introduction of a security hole, and the weakness in design will need to be plugged by other means than traditional cybersecurity, and I think Web3 has the solution. Okay. And a trusted third party is usually costly and it gets costlier because of tighter regulation, uh, a higher compliance costs, and because it's insecure, um, and the risk is increasing by the day, uh, if we can plug this trusted, the trusted third party security hole, there'll be social benefits and, and the profits for Web2. So you have to radically reduce the trusted third party cost and risk. And this is the whole idea of Web3. Web3 is not to get rid of all the trusted third party, all the financial intermediaries or all the other intermediaries that we have. Web3 is to reduce the cost of the trusted third party and to reduce the Web2 risk. And we, we do that by distributing automated trusted third parties across several parties, only a portion of which need to act in a reliable or trustworthy manner for the protocol to be reliable on trustworthy or trustworthy. And this is about consensus. This is about person time fault tolerance. This is about resilience. This is about double spending, uh, which, are, which we are familiar with if you, you are dealing with Web3. 
So where are the Web3 opportunities for all of us, especially uh, some of you are students, some of you are in business, and my own view is that it's the base layer. And layer one, which is the open blockchain, or base layer zero, which is like a base standards for all the blockchains coming together, where every blockchain is a node. So usually we are familiar with base, uh, the layer one, uh, such as uh, Ethereum, uh, such as Bitcoin, but sometimes we can look at layer zero, uh, that uh, which actually allows all the blockchain to come together on the same technical standards. So we need to have sec a secure network, we need to have a uh, secure network, a technical, technically scalable network, we need to have interoperability. We need to be able to decentralize with social scalability. We can have technical scalability with proof of stake, but we may not necessarily have decentralized with social scalability. And that is a major issue with the POS. Um, the, the, other, the other side of the um, opportunities is not just the base layer, but those uh, Web2 companies that have huge potential for consumer adoption that gives very good user experience and new technology for the digitally non-savvy. That means anyone can use the app so that there's mass adoption. Uh, marketing companies and companies like McDonald's, uh, you know, Coffee Bean and so on, they have huge mass consumer adoption capabilities. And if they adopt Web3 from use, instead of using Web2, that those are the great opportunities that we are we will see. So there are many many funds out there, in, especially in Singapore. Uh, some of them are involved, like Rule Seventy Two and Artichoke Capital. They focus on these two areas. Now, if you look through the eyes of the Web Two, the opportunities are this. Okay, new trusted third parties are emerging with lower costs. First, now that these are all non-custodized assets, so banks cannot custodize anything that has been tokenized. You can only custodize keys, wallets, customizing the private keys. Uh, for example, secure multi-computing that they are doing. Uh, they're licensed payment companies like crypto banks uh, in Switzerland, in Singapore. There's token issuing or centralized exchanges that are being licensed now that can have the license to tokenize. And also Web3 security companies that take care of technology risk management. Okay, that's how you look at it from the Web 2, and this is what they're looking into. But you are from Web 3, you're looking back to Web 2. This is what the opportunities are, sticking services. Uh, although it is more centralized, uh, now the people will not switch on the computer for 24 hours. Therefore, they have a, a centralized party to help them to do the sticking. There'll be D-apps, service providers, so that you don't have to assess Ethereum on yourself or other public blockchain, but you can go through the DApp service providers. You can have multi-chain bridging services. You can have stable coin issuers like USDC, USDT. You can have Web3 and security as a service platforms uh, like um, chain, chain, chain list, uh, analysis. You can have some decentralized digital identity providers. You can have all the DeFi, MetaFi, uh, GameFi businesses and so on, or DAO. Uh, so that's from Web3 looking at Web2. But really, it is the Web2.5 that may present the most opportunities. Okay, Web2 and 3 seem to be converging towards Web2.5. For the Web3 com community, you can see that they are now favoring regulation. They embrace regula uh, regulation as a form and, and also um, they they instead of um, having embedded security in the software and the hardware, it is um, it is about embracing regulation as a form of security, and it is uh, a lot of liquidity and price action are only favorable to anything that have a five ending with a five, so like all the meta five and gay five, and with regulation mass adoption may be the likely outcome, and for web two companies have a lot of capital to invest in Web3 technology to enhance profits and lower costs, and they require Web3 security to prepare for more stringent data and privacy protection regulation. So Web2.5 seems to make sense in the current environment, which is a combination of uh, 
centralized server with a web tree, which is blockchain. So you can see that uh, whether it's AI, the ABCD, AI, blockchain, cloud computing, and data analytics, they're all coming together, it's converging towards uh, 2.5. It's not only a convergence of technology, but it's also Web 2 moving towards Web 2, Web 2.5, and Web 3 coming backwards to Web 2.5. So there's some limited form of centralized governance to help with the security, mass adoption, and access to retail and the wholesale market, especially the twin economy of the metaverse, where you can replicate a physical economy in the metaverse where you have a factory in the virtual space as well as the same factory in the physical space. But what are the challenges? First, regulation and political economy. Second, technical challenges. Third, sustainability and talent. Well, there is over financialization, so the regulator is going to come down very hard on web free companies and projects so that you can see all the web free projects. Uh, eventually, even though it's software, they will find ways to regulate it and the compliance costs will go up. And there's also onshoring of services. Regulators and capitalists will want a lot of these web free co companies and projects to be onshore, under their control, even though it's a borderless business. So there will be a lot of regulatory arbitrage and there will be a lot of uh, uh, capitalists working with regulators to try to onshore a lot of these web free companies. So you can see a Web3 um, talent war out there and a Web3 project war out there among the different regulators and the VCs that we will see. So there will be American, there will be the Europeans, there will be the Asians. They are all fighting for the same Web3 projects uh, via regulation and uh, the rich capital. Now, the second one is the technical. Technical scalability issue. Web3, a lot of scalability issue. But for Web3 to take off, you really need to have the hardware. So chip supply is going to be a major problem and the cost is not going to be cheap now that with the US and China problem. And the raw materials to produce the chip uh, is even more important. So we see that uh, Japan, uh, Russia, we can see that Ukraine and all of them will have different control over different types of raw materials to produce the computing and also, of course, the bridges among the, the, the blockchains are important. And in fact, if you focus on the bridges, that is the major problem. Okay. Now, Vitalik has warned that if Ethereum is attacked by 51%, then the RAP ETH will no longer be 100% safe. And you can see that also that the cross-chain cross, cross bridge has massive liquidity. When that happens, hackers will have very low hanging fruits. So the bridge the, 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 the bridge hack can not only affect and drain the liquidity, but will, will also have complex effects uh, for the layer one uh, that we all are familiar with. So what are the challenges for cross-chain? Well, it is a risky business. And a few days ago, you can see the transit swap, which is a cross-chain decentralized exchanges was attacked. And two days ago, Binance, we see another hack um, that, that happened, right? So if you look at uh, chain analysis, uh, they mentioned that up to July this year, there already been 2 billion crypto, cryptocurrency has been stolen. And if you look at the top three loss leaders based on leaderboard of uh, IEKT, REC, are all bridges, attack on bridges. And how do they do that? three methods, according to Rob uh, Banke. Banke said that. First, you can generate a deposit without making a real deposit. And then at the other side, you withdraw the valuable token. Second, you can create a fake deposit, fake de deposit that validates as real, and then you can bypass the validation process or cheat the, the validation uh, the, the confuse the validation process, or you can control most of the validators because if they're governance tokens, then you can uh, approve the fake and malicious transfer. Now, the other thing about Web3 is that we're going to consume a lot of electricity. If it is not green, it is unlikely 
that there will be mass adoption. All the efforts we have done in Web3 will be jammed if we don't have that. And of course, there's a huge talent shortages and you are looking for programming language to learn. There's huge shortages uh, in people who know about Rust, people who know about Move, Motoko, and a lot of people who, who know about compliance. Very few people know about compliance and business strategies that understand beyond technical, political economy, and also regulation. So in summary, what I'm saying is that Web3 is moving towards Web 2.5, and Web3 is favoring regulation, embracing regulation and scalability at the expense of security at layer one for mass adoption. Uh, it, it is a very dangerous thing to do that, but we are seeing that happening. And Web3 may become less inclusive. We have seen that as well. Uh, they just excluded a lot of miners for POW, and they may also uh, exclude the digitally illiterate, and that's the possibility. And bridges are low-hanging fruits for hackers, and the greatest risk remains to be regulatory risk. Because once you change from POW to POS, which a lot of Web3 residing on POS, and the lack of non-technical talent familiar with political economy I think Web3 will be under threat and the dream of having mass adoption is not as simple as changing from POW to POS and increasing the technical scalability. It's a lot more than that because it's about politics, it's about uh, the market structure and so on. And Web2.5 may be the most fruitful ground for business, with, especially with the cash-rich Web3 investors and the tech technical capabilities of Web3 innovators. But to everybody's surprise, in instead of changing Wall Street uh, and the regulators, Wall Street and regulators may be the dominant forces rather than the Web3 community in the very near future, especially for the metaverse. And to end this talk, I just want to leave you something to ponder over. You know, unless Web3 is associated with green tech, doesn't matter if it's POW or POS, and it is responsible innovation to help the world, to contribute to the world, to make it this a better world, it is unlikely to have mass adoption because most people don't want and government will try in whatever, whatever way it can to disallow it. So with that, I end my talk and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for listening.